On July 20, 1969, Neil Armstrong became the first human being to set foot on the moon. His team accomplished its goal with millions of television viewers watching live. Yet, even after his historic moonwalk, Armstrong kept his feet on the ground. However, the facts surrounding that historic mission are more well known than the story of the man who took that first step. So, today we're going to take a look at the story of Neil Armstrong, the man who changed history when he walked on the moon. But before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History channel and let us know in the comments below what other space-related topics you would like to hear about. Okay, we are launching this story in three, two, one. We have liftoff. Neil Armstrong was born near Wapakoneta, Ohio on August 5th, 1930. He developed a love of flying at a young age after watching air races, enjoyed reading about the Wright brothers, and at about five years old, he took his first plane flight with his father in a Ford Trimotor, which was otherwise known as a Tin Goose. As a hobby, young Neil built balsa wood airplane models and simultaneously taught himself flight engineering and mechanics. He worked odd jobs around his hometown to pay for his $9 an hour flight lessons and he received his pilot's license at the age of 16, before he even learned to drive a car. After studying aeronautical engineering in college, Armstrong flew missions for the U.S. military in Korea and tested aircraft for the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, later renamed NASA. His experience earned him a massive amount of respect from other members of the air and space community, and he was considered well qualified to be a space mission commander. Neil Armstrong was no stranger to danger, as he had faced several potentially deadly flight situations prior to Apollo 11. In 1966, as part of the Gemini 8 mission, Armstrong helped complete the first docking of two spacecraft in orbit. The crew at Mission Control began to celebrate the milestone, but it was premature. A malfunction sent the two connected spacecraft into a spin that was so fast, Armstrong's vision began to blur. Acting quickly, he tried various countermeasures. Finally, he was able to use the re-entry system to fix the problem. He then aborted the mission and returned himself and his crewmates safely to Earth. After Gemini 8, Armstrong spent most of his time developing a module that simulated a lunar landing. The vehicle required extensive testing, and one of these tests nearly got Armstrong killed. While in a flight over 200 feet above the ground, the module began to smoke and spin. While it plummeted to the Earth below, Armstrong barely escaped by parachute. Unshaken by the near-death experience, he went right back to work. There was no master plan for Apollo 11 to be the first space mission to land on the moon. It just kind of worked out that way. Apollo 8, 9, and 10 had allowed for incremental advancements that gradually convinced NASA a lunar landing could be completed. Apollo 11 was given the go-ahead to finally attempt the feat. Neil Armstrong was the next in line to command a mission, but who would get to take the first step onto the moon's surface was another matter. Everyone knew it would be a historic moment. Buzz Aldrin lobbied for the chance, while Armstrong left it up to NASA. The deciding factor turned out to be the layout of the lunar module itself. Armstrong's seat was closest to the hatch, so he would be first. Apollo 11 wasn't the first rocket to go to space, but it would be the first to attempt a landing on alien soil. Armstrong had practiced piloting the lunar module that would carry the astronauts to the moon's surface using simulations, but no one had ever done it under actual conditions before. When the time finally came, things started off smoothly. But at 33,000 feet above the lunar surface, alarms went off in the module, and ground control warned that the onboard computer was overloading. Armstrong quickly realized that the automated landing system had brought them to a spot miles away from their intended landing spot. Even scarier, they were headed right towards some dangerously large boulders. He took full manual control of the craft and, in what might be history's highest stakes hunt for a parking spot, he tried to find a clear space to land through the moon fog. Uh, apparently there's fog on the moon. They had only 50 seconds of fuel remaining when Armstrong found a safe area and landed the lunar module on the surface of the moon. The schedule called for Aldrin and Armstrong to sleep once they landed on the moon. But on the precipice of one of the single most historic moments in the history of the human species, not surprisingly, 
They were way too excited to nap. The first six and a half hours after the landing were spent making safety checks. But once they were complete, Armstrong pushed open the door, climbed down the ladder, and became the first person to ever set foot on the moon. As he took the historic first step, Armstrong uttered what would become one of the most famous quotes of the modern era. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Or did he? Many have noted that the quote, as it sounded that day, didn't quite make sense since man and mankind mean the same thing. What Armstrong intended to say was, that's one small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind. What went wrong is a matter of debate. Some believe Armstrong misspoke, while others hold that the missing word was obscured by static in the radio transmission. In his reluctance to add to his legend, Armstrong steadfastly refused to clarify what he said that day. And does it matter? I mean, he walked on the moon. Maybe he got excited. Thanks to an exterior camera, we have grainy footage of Armstrong's descent down the lunar module ladder to the surface. However, of the many photos taken on the moon's surface during the Apollo 11 mission, Neil Armstrong only really appears in one. The reason is because Buzz Aldrin failed to take photos of Armstrong. The only direct photographic image of Armstrong on the moon is a landscape shot. He appears in the corner as a tiny astronaut removing equipment from the module. His back is to the camera. In another famous shot, Armstrong's form is just visible as a reflection in Aldrin's visor. Some accused Aldrin of not taking pictures of Armstrong out of bitterness over being number two. Aldrin, however, claimed the reason was simply that Armstrong held the camera for most of the time they spent on the moon. According to Aldrin, Armstrong never asked for a photo of himself, and it was not a mission priority. In his autobiography, Aldrin would express regret over not capturing Armstrong on film. Armstrong, for his part, said that Aldrin had no reason to take his picture and it never occurred to him to want one since Buzz was the far more photogenic of the crew. When all was said and done, Armstrong and Aldrin spent two hours and 36 minutes walking on the surface of the moon. During that time, Armstrong made any celebration secondary to the work they were charged with performing. He would later recall, the checklists were all over us. We weren't there to meditate. After taking several moments to snap a few photos of Aldrin, the two men immediately went about setting up experiments, speaking with President Richard Nixon, planting the American flag, and collecting nearly 50 pounds of moon rock and other surface material. In contrast to many of his fellow astronauts who went on to write books and make headlines, Neil Armstrong remained a mostly private individual after returning from the moon. Maintaining an interest in aeronautics, he continued to work at NASA as an administrator, taught aerospace engineering at the University of Cincinnati, and served on a commission charged with determining what caused the Challenger explosion. His reserved personality meant co-workers frequently saw him as cold, though at the same time he was widely praised for his humility. According to his ex-wife, Janet, Neil felt guilty about receiving so much attention for something he considered a group effort. He tended to remove himself from the spotlight, but there were exceptions. He participated in an Apollo 11 world tour with the rest of the crew after the mission and frequently spoke at events held in remembrance of the historic landing. Armstrong didn't seem to enjoy doing interviews or discussing his thoughts and emotions about the Apollo 11 mission, but he likely felt some level of nostalgia. After his death in 2012, his wife found a bag of parts and tools from the lunar module in his closet. The bag was eventually identified as a McDivitt purse, which is a bag astronauts take into space to store small parts and other loose items they might need. Armstrong had taken this one with him on Apollo 11. His wife believed he kept it as a souvenir. Armstrong's McDivitt purse also included his waist tether, data acquisition camera, utility light, and emergency wrench. Armstrong never told anyone he had collected and kept these items. Though he briefly allowed NASA to use him as a promotional asset after the Apollo 11 mission, Neil Armstrong was extremely uncomfortable being treated as a celebrity. He went to great pains to avoid things that would shine a spotlight on his personal life and retreated from situations that compromised his privacy. For example, after learning that his barber was saving his hair to sell, he switched to getting his haircuts exclusively at home. 
Despite his discomfort with fame, until 2003, Armstrong was happy to sign autographs for fans and charity fundraising events. However, when he learned that many of them were being sold on eBay, he stopped signing. During the Apollo 11 mission, astronauts placed a plaque on the moon's surface that reads, Here men from the planet Earth first set foot upon the moon. July 1969 AD. We came in peace for all mankind. However, the plaque wasn't the only thing the astronauts left behind. Because the moon has no atmosphere and all of its water is frozen, there's no force to cause erosion, which means Aldrin and Armstrong's footprints remain there to this very day. It's also the reason the American flag the astronauts planted was designed to stand up stiffly on its own. They knew there would be no wind to blow it. So what do you think? Why would anybody think the moon landing was a conspiracy? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, check out some of these other videos from Our Weird History.